Well, hello. Wow. Thank you guys so much. And thank you, Jocelyn. And hello, Comic-Con. Thank you guys for being here. I am so excited to be here with you all for this very special and important panel. So let's get started. Is there one singular moment in anyone's career where you thought to yourself, okay, I'm meant to be here, I'm meant to be doing this? This question is open to anyone. Well, I still feel like an imposter. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, it's that syndrome where you think you're going to get found out. <laughs> yeah, I'm, first of all, just thanks. Uh, thanks for uh, hosting this, and thanks to Impact24. Um, I, I guess I was... When I look back to kind of the work I did recently with uh, the flight attendant, you know, which took me all the way to Iceland, um, mm. I was I found myself, you know, at you know Iceland's in the, in November it has about four hours of daylight, and I was tasked <laughs> to uh, shoot a scene of um, four of our amazing stars, Kaylee Cuoco, Rosie Perez, or Margaret Cho, Michelle Gomez, you know, boarding this, uh, very fancy helicopter, um, in the daylight. And so we had to kind of hit that perfect daylight window. Uh, so I was standing there around 10 in the morning and the sun was actually finally rising. And I heard my AD get on his walk and he walks over to me and goes, the helicopter is coming. And I, I just, took a look into the, over the horizon and I saw this light five miles away just approaching uh, and, and this helicopter just like thunderous helicopter like roared over my head and just landed on its mark exactly where it needed to be facing exactly the way, I'd, we, the way we planned it. We'd, uh, we said the helicopter has to be framed against this gorgeous cliff with all these beautiful birds. And the sun will rise over there. And then Kaylee and Rosie and Michelle and, Mich and Margaret would, you know, come up over this cliff edge and they would walk over and, and board this helicopter. And so in, this, in a matter of three, three hours, all of that happened. And um, I just found myself in awe and said, yeah, this is pretty cool. I'm happy to be here. Happy to be in Iceland, and thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All right, well, let's take a deeper dive into everyone's projects, because let's face it, you are all incredible women who have worked on some of the most exciting projects in TV and film in the past years. So, Jennifer, let's start with you again, and the flight attendant. Now, I've seen both seasons. I'm almost done with season two. What would you say was your directing approach coming onto season two? Right, so, you know, as a director who works in television, uh, sometimes you find yourself directing uh, episodes in different seasons. You know, I've, I've worked on season one of The Boys. I did directed uh, season two of Riverdale and season one and three of Stargirl, DC Stargirl. Um, and every season's different. Um, for season two of The Flight Attendant, uh, you know, in season one, we had established Kaylee as an alcoholic, um, mm -hmm. and in season two, it was all about her struggle with her sobriety while also being framed for more murder. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, we got to make use again of this Mind Palace device, where, um, you know, in season one, she's speaking to the man who was murdered. In season two, uh, Kaylee had the opportunity to act against yourself, you know. There were four versions of Kaylee on the screen at once. Uh, a black sweater, uh, Cassie, who is very uh, dark and depressed, a gold dress Cassie who is super nihilistic, um, regular Cassie, and a, a perfect version of Cassie. And so my job was to not only support uh, Kaylee in her now twice Emmy-nominated performance, but also, you know, put her on screen uh, four versions of her at the same time in a really in really dynamic shots. So we mo made um, great use of motion control rigs, um, split screens, and my job was to do all of that while kind of bringing in the show um, on time and on budget. Um, so that was uh, that kind of sums up the approach, <laughs> and it was a blast. We had a great time, and we're really happy with the results. Yeah, it's a, re it's a really good show. So yeah. definitely can't wait to finish watching it. Now, as below-the-line artists, how do you use the platform you have to tell empowering stories or shape inspirational characters? Arlene, I'd love to start off with you with this question, and how you use hair to convey character personalities in P-Valley? So, I think it's very important to definitely read the script um, and study it. Um, 
what I do is I take notes as I'm reading the scripts. Mm -hmm. And as I'm reading the scripts and I'm looking at the characters, my creative juices are flowing at the same time. And I am able to distinguish like what kinds of hair types that we're gonna be doing for each character. Um, that may or may not um, collaborate with the um, showrunner, but it's good to just have those ideas already in your mind of how you, um, as a hairstylist and a department head, want the hair to look um, for each character. And then as you meet with the showrunner or the creative director, then you guys can actually collaborate on all of those ideas that you all have inside of your minds to create this one masterpiece for this uh, particular actor. So that's how I approach it. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Nice. Now, Cameron, Pam and Tommy had so many great fashion moments that it earned you an Emmy nomination. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so as the costume designer for the widely acclaimed limited series, what would you say was your ultimate goal in recreating real life iconic uh, looks? Um, yes, thank you for that question. Um, I. My ultimate goal was to make sure that uh, Lily, who plays Pamela Anderson, and Sebastian, who plays Tommy Lee, um, that they um, looked like the actual people. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the approach that all of us had from the very beginning was that we never wanted to make fun of these people. We were telling a, a story about a crime that happened. And um, these people are in, in the public eye and they are seen as a certain way, dressing a certain way and doing certain things in the 90s and we wanted to make sure that we were holding true to these actual people and the story that we were telling. Um, I think that um, we were all in agreement that th this wasn't a satire, that this was these really um, real people that w were dealing with a crime. and. Um, and so my, my approach always was to make sure that it felt real, um, you know, uh, designing and dressing for real people, um, you would think maybe would be easier to do than uh, creating a character, but it's actually harder because you wanna um, <clears throat> finesse it in a way that, um, at, that the, if the person were to watch it, they would say, oh yeah, that is how I wore it, or that is exactly how it laid on my body, or. Um, and also because they were in the public eye, it, um, there's a lot of people that are going to be looking at it to make sure it does look like them. And mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, so the, the approach always for me, um, I'm also a little bit of a purist when it comes to period clothing. Um, so I, I try my best to uh, use all my resources to find these actual pieces because it wasn't as long ago that a lot of this stuff is still around. Mm -hmm. And then if we were recreating anything, it had to look exactly as it did at the time. Like the, the, the shade of red for the Baywatch bathing suit needed to be that exact shade of red that they wore in, for Baywatch. So I did a little bit of deep dive research on that to find out what bathing suit company, <clears throat> excuse me, it's hard to talk through these masks sometimes, um, what uh, bathing suit company uh, made the original bathing suits for the show because there are so many people wearing it. It must have been, you know, mass produced. Wow. Um, and I did. I was able to find out that TYR was the company that made their bathing suits, and then each bathing suit was altered per character. So the one that Pamela Anderson wore um, was altered to fit her body to accentuate parts of her body. And then there are other actors that maybe were a little more athletic, and so they wore it in a different way. So we wanted to make sure that this bathing suit that we were making was the, that same red, so we ordered the same fabric and um, created it to look exactly as she did. Um, so yeah, my ultimate goal is to make sure it looks real and that you know never takes you out of the story when you're watching it, that, that you really believe that these people that are portraying these um, real people in the story are, are actually them and you're not ever pulled away. Wow, well as you can see, there's a lot that goes into making these film and television uh, shows to make it seem as realistic as possible. Now, Melanie, as a production designer, you've worked across so many genres, including dramas, comedies, and horror. How does this variety help your overall creative process? When I started really working on um, in film, I set out to do as many different genres as possible because um, you know, you can get typecast mm -hmm. 
just like an actor, like, you know, a production designer, costume designer, hair, whatever, sorry. Just stickulating here. Um, so you can, you can get typecast, you can, you can get, you know, your whole career could just be comedy or, and, and I wanted to go a little broader um, just because my interest from show to show is doing an environment that I haven't done before. So, and, and if you go across genres, you're more likely to be able to experience that, you know, than say, you know, all romantic comedies, there's, there's kind of a range that, that of uh, production design that you would encounter with that. So, in some, in some ways, it, I don't want to say it was planned, it was my desire mm. to have that opportunity, and I've been really lucky um, and that, you know, that means that you could, like, I, I really started with, I worked for a long time before I started production designing. I worked my way up. But um, I started doing features pretty much with Blumhouse, and my first feature was The Purge. And so then I did a bunch of Blumhouse stuff. Thank you. Um, <laughs> that was a crazy show. Um, I did a bunch of Blumhouse stuff, and it was a lot of horror, although I got the opportunity through them to also do Whiplash, mm -hmm. which was a drama. So I had a drama, I had the horror, and I kept on bouncing back and forth. And then I got the opportunity to do a comedy, which was um, Hello, My Name is Doris, and with Sally Field, which is a really great movie if you haven't seen it. But it was tiny. So you kind of take a hit, like it's, you know, the budgets are, it's not like the straight, but you know, ascension, you're kind of jumping around. But it, it's, you know, I like the process and I like the work. So it's been, it's been really a joy to have the opportunity to do that. Awesome. Yeah. Just a little side question. Which one, do you have a favorite genre that you like better than a different one? I kind of get, I kind of fall in love with what I'm working on at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just finished doing the clauses for Disney Plus, which is with Tim Allen. It's fantasy, mm -hmm. and of course, while I'm doing it, I'm going, this is it, this is it, this is the one, this is what I want to do. But you know, now I'm going to go and do Minx, which is a period piece for HBO Max. So you know, I'm there. I'm in 1972. That's where I live now in my head for the next go. six months. Awesome. Uh, so Hannah, you had a part actually in writing episodes three and four of the latest entry to the Star Wars franchise, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Yes. Woo! That's awesome. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about working on the series? Yeah. Um, the first thing about working on the series is just the terror of like, we don't want this to be bad. <laughs> please, please. Um, so. It, it, there was a lot of expectation and pressure um, and sort of reviewing the canon and discussing what was happening for Obi-Wan in this period of time and what we wanted to deal with emotionally and um, what his relationships were or lack thereof and how we get him from the character of Ewan to you know, the Obi-Wan that we ultimately meet um, later on in, in the series. And so that was a lot of pressure and also very exciting and lots of discussions. And Lucasfilm is such a wealth of, um, of support and knowledge. And we worked with consultants there to talk about what would be happening, um, what would be happening in that period of time for him. And then we, we discussed the the different story arcs and how we would see his um, how we would deal with his powers, how we would deal with, with what was happening to him and his relationship to the Jedi and his sort of um, his emotional breakdown essentially uh, when he when he realizes what um, has ha become of Anakin and how we would break that over the course of the six episodes. And yeah, and then we just revised and revised and revised. And then it was shot. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Yeah. I definitely love Disney, so that is next on my bucket list to watch. Yeah. Brigitte, I believe I said that correctly. Yes, you did. Perfect, all right. There are many visual effects in each episode of 911 Lone Star. What would you say is your process for planning and the execution of these effects in this show like this, in the show like? It's, it's a very interesting show. First of all, if, if you're familiar with it, every episode 
has a different emergency that happens. So we're never quite sure what we're going to get into. We don't know what it's going to be. Uh, sometimes we don't know until the very last minute. So we've done everything from tornadoes, volcanoes. We've had uh, snakes, scorpions, bees. We've had, we had four episodes through a snowstorm. This takes place in Texas. Um, <laughs> we've had floods. We've had people getting stuck in really weird places. So it, it, what it starts out with is you, you, get, you get the script, right? Or you get the beat sheet, whatever you get first, just to give you an indication of what's coming. And then you just start planning. That's all about planning. Figuring out what are your resources. Um, do I have, you know, wh which people do I need to start uh, getting with to, to prepare for what we're going to have to do? And the, the, the example that we had up there was, was an interesting one because uh, we didn't really know until the last minute which building we were going to collapse. In fact, they started, uh, we didn't have a, a script until very late in the game. Um, we looked at a couple of different buildings, and then all of a sudden, uh, we were going to have one week to do this. So a, a lot of that is talking to the director, um, saying, look, I have a feeling you're going to want to see this thing fall. It wasn't scripted, but we, I had a feeling it was going to be in there. I listened to them. I know they wanted to see it. So then I go back and I talk to my team and figure out well, how, can we, how can we accomplish this in, in less than a week or two. Um, actually, it turned out to be a week. It, it, normally, and we have done this in other episodes where we did collapse a building, it took well over a month. Uh, we had about a week for this one. So we did something a little untraditional. I would talk to, um, we have a, a crew that, that deals with Unreal Engine. A lot of you are probably familiar with that, right? Um, to do different parts of it and then talk to the, the map painting part. And then I would go to the director on things like this and say, all right, I have an idea. Tell me if we can, we can make this work. This is how I'm going to do it. If we're just careful about how we shoot it, we can accomplish this in one week. And, uh, and that's just an example of what we, we deal with every, every week. We sometimes are working on these effects up until um, the day before it airs. Um, so sometimes <laughs> it's Friday night and we're still working, uh, or Saturday, but you know, that particular one, I, I believe we, we finished it on Friday night, so we did pretty good. Actually, I feel like we had a lot of time on it in, in, in that respect. Um, but, but there's just so many pieces that have to come together, and we just have to keep an open dialogue with the, the creatives. I work very hard, you know, very carefully with the production designer, also with the special effects team. Those are the guys that do the, the real explosions and all that. Um, to figure out well, what do I need to do to piggyback off of piggyback off of what they're doing? What do I need to enhance? Um, how much can you build? What do I need to fix? I mean, you're going to go this high. Maybe I'm going to go higher than for the wide shots. Um, and also talking to the stunts. What do you have to do to do your job? And then what do I need to keep an eye out for? I mean, you're going to toss this guy off a building. How far is he going to fall? Do I need, need to make him go faster? Do I need to slow him down? that sort of thing. So it is just a tremendous amount of planning and it doesn't, it starts as soon as we get an inkling of what the effect's going to be, all the way up to the end. Wow. Well, clearly a lot goes on in TV shows and all things like that, like rain, sleet, or shine, <laughs> we're going to get it done. Yeah. <laughs> if I can say, like, this is one of my favorite things is to hear all of these women who excel at their jobs and their departments and their craft. and. And one of my favorite things about film and television is, is that it's such a team sport. We all have to know how to work together. And it's my favorite thing is, my favorite thing is when I get to work with a lot of women. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's, a, it's kind of, it makes a difference sometimes. Um, and I've, I've done a lot of shows involving a lot of men and it's always wonderful. But there's a special quality, you know, when we all can kind of sit in a circle together or, or around a table and go, okay, this is how we're gonna do it, okay? And we all find we all find a way to bring something special to the table. Oh, that's awesome. There you go. Women supporting women all the time. <laughs> well, thank you all for sharing your work. This panel again is all about women in Hollywood and how you're all changing the status quo. We're here to have an important conversation about closing that gender disparity gap and how you're all here changing the status quo with the work that you do. Now this question is for all of you. How do you think we can continue to support the empowerment of women, especially in department head positions like yourselves in the industry? I, I think there needs to be, um, it, it's about awareness. It's about being cognizant of, of the group of people that you're looking at, especially people that are looking to fill these positions. Uh, it, typically you'll have a, a, a group that you'll look at, you, you cast your net. If you find that you cast your net just a little bit farther, you're going to find some people that are underrepresented into the, in these roles. 
and, uh, and right. you'll be pleasantly surprised with what you get. You're going to get different voices. You're going to get different ideas, um, and, and they're all out there. You just have to look a little bit farther. So I think there's a, uh, oh, the awareness is what's important. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I, I mentor. I mentor a lot of people, um, you know, and bring women into positions that, that maybe they didn't have, you know, five, ten years ago. I, I mean, there's still often, and this happens less often, but, uh, you know, the production designer, I will often be the only woman in the room. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you just help. Yep. Yeah. Educate, help, mentor. I mean, it's also incumbent upon, you know, and it's, and it's happening. We've witnessed it. I've seen it. Incumbent upon the stakeholders, the studios, to, to kind of foster an environment that supports women and build an infrastructure that kind of enables women to kind of progress. I learned um, over many, many years on the ground and and even if you do go to school i think it's a real transition working on a film or a television project is not really something that you can learn fully until you do it mm -hmm. because it's crazy yeah. really yeah. in a good way but it's it's always insane and it's always different so you know you make room for people who don't have the experience and they'll come in with sometimes with just real raw talent or raw mm -hmm. creativity and they don't have a preconceived idea about you have to do it in this way and you can get some some really brilliant gems out of that particularly in my department you know like, yeah. and isn't, it, isn't it fun you know the fearlessness that someone comes in with you know yeah. if they don't have if they haven't been kind of brutalized by the industry yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that fearlessness is much more creative sometimes yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely yeah. and to your previous point Melanie I think like encouraging people below us to have the sort of audacity to dream. I, I think that mm -hmm. I certainly experience um, what, you, what you talked about, just some generalized imposter syndrome in every role. And I find that a lot of men in the industry are like, of course I could do that. Um, whoops. <laughs> Whereas uh, some of the women who are maybe even more um, experienced are like, I'm not sure, um, I'm not, I don't know if I'm ready. And um, I think true. pushing uh, back against that and just encouraging people to um, to really spread their wings has been helpful for my yeah. mentees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like to add one thing about um, female department heads. Um, my department is has always been primarily women, and um, but when we work together with say female production designers or or women directors or um, writers. It really raises the bar for us as a department to um, be seen as an equal among other departments. Um, we are still pay, uh, fighting for pay equity with, you know, production designers, and and um, I think that once we have more female production designers, they're going to see that we are equal. That we, we, women do a lot, and um, and so I just, you know, working with women has been great for me because it. It makes me feel, you know, as well deserved when I'm in my job, and um, you know, I, I applaud these women that become production designers because it's going to just help us in the in the long run. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And now that actually leads me to my next point. Hollywood has historically been a very male and white dominated industry. Women and BIPOC creatives are continuing to make their way in, leaving their own mark and opening the doors for other marginalized groups. How do you see the future of Hollywood heading and the push to include more underrepresented voices? Well, I mean, I, could, I think we're getting there. And again, I think it's really mm -hmm. contingent upon the people that work within the industry. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, these, it just takes time. Power structures, people like to keep the power that they have. And, you know, I've never personally, not really, not once, I've been very lucky. Um, felt um, diminished in any way by anyone I've worked with. I've worked with really great people and a lot of them are white men. So, um, mm -hmm. but that being said, you know, you just, you gotta have, you have to have a door open to get in. And then once you get in, you have to prove yourself. And I, I think that, that it just is a matter of time. Mm -hmm. The more people that get in, mm -hmm. the more that, that the, the money sees that we can do these jobs. Yep. And, and, and 
be successful and lead. I, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about mm -hmm. human beings in general that because you're a certain gender or, or a certain skin tone or whatever, you don't have an ability, and which is crazy. You know, it's it's there in everyone. There's potential there in it, everyone, and and but it really always comes down to you know this is a business. Can we can we make this profitable? And the more we do it, and the longer we do it, and the more that people see that it works, it, then you know it, I think we're it's great. I think we're really getting there. But I think it's going to take more time. It just takes time. Of course, you know. I want to piggyback off of that. I think that um, each of us has a, a individual responsibility to reach back and to open the door for the person that's coming in behind us and that's trying to get in. And that's why on Pea Valley, as a department head of hair, I made sure that I hired non-union um, people just to do BG to start out into the industry because there's so many people that are just looking for a way in and just trying to understand and figure out how. Yeah. And for me personally, it took me so long to get in the union because nobody would e even open that door for me to even get in, to get the hours that I needed to get in and the time and experience and just the training that I needed to get in. And so for me, I think it's a responsibility because we're not gonna be here forever. We're not gonna be in this industry forever. The retirement is coming. Regardless whether you like it or not, you're gonna get old. And so why not, you know, why not open that why not open that door for the next person that is coming in behind you? Train them if you have to, or let them watch you do what you're what, what you're doing so that they can come up and be the next future um, you know, representatives of the industry in a good way. Um, because we have a lot of people that are coming in the industry not trained properly, people are not, you know, uh, passing the baton and actually letting them know how to do these jobs that we're in. So I think it's just an individual responsibility for us to do that. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, definitely. I was definitely non-union at one point and had to yeah. kind of break my way in and yeah. learn it by being on set and the terminology and how everything works. It's, you got to kind of lead yourself, but that's why we need each other to kind of yes. empower each other and push that and lead the way for each other. So yes. you make a very good point. Next question is, this is a little bit easier for you guys. Um, <laughs> if you could tell your younger self one thing, what would it be? It's kind of super on topic, but it is find, form a community of peers uh, who are women. Um, I, don't, I don't think I had that soon enough, actually. Um, and, 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 and use each other as resources to kind of keep helping each other up. I think that's, that is absolutely something that I would have wanted sooner. I think for me it's perseverance. You know, you look back and you, you think um, things aren't going as fast as you want. You're not getting as far as you think you should be. You see people around you maybe moving a little bit faster than you are. Um, it's just trust that it's going to go where you want, that those paths might be a little bit more windy, but you're still going to get where you want to go. That is something I would have wanted to tell myself. And, and or sometimes I want to tell myself I should have listened to my mother and become a, <laughs> an accountant, but otherwise, I'm really happy that I persevered and stuck with it. Anyone else? I, I think it's also perseverance. It's uh, enjoying the journey. Um, mm. um, and also for me as a teenager, always, um, you know, I dressed pretty crazy <laughs> in the 80s and that, you know, one day I might actually make money by doing it. <laughs> so yeah, enjoy it and be true to yourself. And if you really have a dream, just keep keep at it. Yeah. There you go. Yep. Yeah, perseverance. Fortune favors the bold, I guess, in a way. Mm -hmm. Like there, you know, I think it would have been nice when I was younger to truly understand um, the humanness of everyone that works in the film industry. And, you know, your, uh, maybe what you, you know, somebody might consider a shortcoming or, or what you yourself consider a shortcoming com probably is one of the things that's really going to back up your talent. I mean, it, it's an odd group of people who choose this life. Um, so, you know, that you don't have to be perfect, that's for sure. Like, 
Oh yeah. Lean into your I, uniqueness. Mm -hmm. I think I would have told myself that doing new things doesn't feel comfortable. I think I kept waiting to be on any staff of a show I was on. I would be like, why am I nervous to pitch this joke? Or how come I don't feel like I know what I'm doing? And it's because I didn't. Like I didn't yet. And any time I'm on a new project or property, um, I think the expectation that I have for myself when I was younger was like, you should feel calm. <laughs> and um, it's OK that new things make you feel nervous. It means you're challenging yourself. And I think ideally, we're all doing different types of shows and different types of genres. And um, every anytime you're stepping into a new thing, it will feel uncomfortable. And that, that doesn't mean you're doing it wrong. Awesome. Well, something exciting now. What is everyone working on next? Jennifer, let's start with you. Now, again, I am a huge Disney fan, so I hear that you're working on a Disney Descendants spinoff called Pocket Watch. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, I'm very excited. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of in the middle of it right now. We're in uh, soft prep, which includes casting and uh, location scouting. I'll be leaving for Europe tomorrow. Ooh, um, wow. It's very exciting. Uh, but Pocket Watch, the Pocket Watch is, um, yeah, it's an expansion of the Disney's Ascendance uh, franchise, which, if you don't know, is a uh, follows the kids of Disney villains. And um, in our case, uh, we are following the misadventures of the daughter of the Queen of Hearts and the daughter of Cinderella. Um, so that's probably the extent of what I can say at this moment, okay. but I am having the best time. Um, and it's going to have a lot of songs, and it will be a musical, um, a big musical. And we're having, you know, we're excited to share it with you at some point in the future. Awesome. Arlene, anything that you're working on next that you'd love to share with us? That you can say. <laughs> well, P Valley was a nine month show, so that was uh, almost a year. Wow. Yeah. That, and so I've decided to take a mental, a mental break <laughs> in between. Um, so right now I am like day playing. Mm -hmm. And if you guys know what day playing is, it's just playing like uh, uh, going to different shows, doing hair for background. And that's been a real therapy for me right now <laughs> until P Valley season three either picks back up or I pick up another show. So that's what's going on with me right now. Awesome. You do you, girl. That's right. Take that break. <laughs> How about for you? Um, yes, I'm on a, a Apple TV show right now um, with Seth Rogen again and uh, Rose Byrne, who I worked with before on the first season of Physical. Um, and it's directed by Nicholas Stoller, who they all, all three of them did the na all the neighbors films together. Um, but this is a different spin on uh, the relationship between Rose and, and Seth. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's modern day, contemporary, uh, co just straight up comedy. It's, it's fun. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm working on the new Muppet Mayhem show. So, yeah, I'm super excited. It's for Disney Plus, um, and I can't tell, say much more about it. But I will say that getting notes from a puppet, you've never lived. <laughs> <laughs> you've gotten notes straight from a puppet's mouth. <laughs> um, I'm going to be working on season two of Minx for HBO Max. Excellent. Yeah, I'm really excited about it. I wish I could tell you what I was working on because it's really cool. Ooh. Um, it's creature work. It's going to be a fan favorite. You have to wait till Christmas. Uh, in the meantime, I'm uh, getting ready to start up on the next season of Lone Star. Um, and that will start up in August. And it's going to be a very wild ride this season, I bet, like all the others. Nice. Well, that's really awesome. And I'm honestly inspired and impressed by all you ladies here today. And we can't wait to see what you guys have coming on the screen. Now, just before we finish up and wrap up, we're going to open uh, up to the audience for any questions you guys may have for the ladies here. We have one right in the back, right over there. Hi, congratulations. I can speak to that. Um, 
Um, actually, I'll use Bill and Ted as an example. I, I mean, you have to get used to that because that happens. When I teach production design, uh, I always tell my students, have a plan. Like, you need to come with, obviously, a full set. But you should have a plan B because things change. I mean, even if you're plan A, they love Sometimes things change enough in the writing or the director's approach or even the schedule and they're like, we got to do something else. So you really have to be fluid and you have to learn to adjust and adapt. And on Bill and Ted, I got, we did pretty good. My first choices on most things, but um, one set got kicked back. Dean uh, Pariso kept on going, no, that's not it. No, that's not it. And I'll try again. And I'm like, oh God. I finally got it, but you know, um, it hurts. It always hurts. You don't get over that, but you get used to it, I think. Mm. Yeah, and you have to take chances. You have to put it out there and see what happens. And because and yeah. most of the time, you know, some, you will come up with a great idea and people will love it and they'll remember that. And they'll come to you next time and That's say, great. So, what do you think about this now? Um, you, you just have to take the good with the bad. And also having the faith that working with such a big team of people, like you don't have to have all the answers yeah. and that eventually the best ideas will rise to the top and um, with all the different iterations of things, ultimately you'll get to a place that you couldn't have gotten to on your own. Yeah. That's always That's really true. fun yeah. discovery. It is collaborative for sure. Very much so. You know, it, it goes back to that question of what I would tell my younger self. It's, it's my dream would be, it would be to be able to be as creative as possible and just put on screen something that I'm really excited about, but actually have zero ego about it. Mm -hmm. um, if I could just remove my ego, <laughs> life would be great. Um, and, 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 then, and all this collaboration would work really smoothly. So ideally, I would never have those highs and lows. And so that's kind of what I'm working on all the time mm -hmm. with I meditation. Think I think also taking chances, um, whether they're uh, uh, liked or not liked, it, it shows your creative potential. And I think you know, for most of the directors that I work with, they're, they're, they get excited when I kind of take a chance and kind of push forward on something. And even if it's not right, you know, it's like it, it shows that you're, um, you're uh, invested in whatever it takes to make it happen. And um, so I, I think always always try to take a chance and show what you think it is, no matter what. Yeah. Any other questions? Sure, you can stand right up here to the mic. Um, you <laughs> sure, you can just speak loud. <laughs> um, I, Melanie mentioned earlier um, about being tech passing constantly, like trying to push yourself out of uh, your comfort zone as creators. Um, but I wanted to ask all of you how you avoid I think you have to be really proactive about it because like we all have teams of people who <clears throat> make money based on just kind of throwing us into the same thing over and over again. Um, so if it's, you know, if, if I do a comedy, they'll say, oh, we have this, this young writer who does comedy and they'll pitch me on all the comedies, which is great, but you have to be really proactive and write a new, for in my particular case, like write a new sample that just shows this is totally different. Or when I wanted to do Willow, like I, um, I, I did a whole new packet of things just to show that there was versatility there. Because um, I think people don't have as much imagination as you might hope to say like, well, I bet she could do that. Like sometimes you just have yeah. to put it out there that I can, I can do that and I'll, and I'll show you. Mm -hmm. Another great thing is uh, social media for me as a hairstylist is that I can broadcast all of the different looks that I can do. Um, when I was growing up, I always wanted to know how to do everything when it came to hair. So I don't want to just be typecast as like a wig maker or, um, you know, um, doing one particular texture of hair. It, I always wanted to do all different textures, all different types of hair. Um, I'm a master barber, so it's like I always want to do everything when it came down to hair so that there would be no doors that would be closed in my arena. And so I think that that's a good thing as well. All right, so I have one last question for you ladies right here. What advice would you give to female creatives either entering or already in the industry? One piece of advice. 
Well, I got a great piece of advice not too long ago from someone from my own company, from Fuse Effects, from one of my colleagues. And that, that advice was to join groups. You know, um, there are groups out there that support underrepresented voices and, and people. Um, and, and it's a great way to get your, your, your face out there, get your name out there, and meet other people that can also support you and lead you in different ways. There's, there's things like Women in Media that, that supports um, Below the Line. They're a great group. Um, the, the HPA, the, the VES, that's a visual effects society for, for my folk. Um, but to join those groups and really get out there and network with people. And it's great advice because it, it, it has worked. Yeah, yeah. And I would say to not ask permission. Like, there are so many resources mm -hmm. today for getting your work out there and making your own stuff on a really small shoestring budget. Um, so I think waiting for the perfect circumstance to, for someone to give you permission sometimes takes too long. So just like do it while you, while you want to do it now. And then you can show everyone what you've got. Yeah, and when people say no or, you know, you go to a job interview and maybe you don't get it, I, I just think you just have to persevere. Just keep doing it. Mm -hmm. Like one of the things that's very important to, to learn over time, and it took me time because I'm a very sensitive person. So, you know, I got beat up for a minute when I first started uh, in the film industry sometime long ago in the mm -hmm. last century. Um, and it, it takes a minute to, to no, it's kind of like in response to that other question. It's like, how do you feel? Well, you always feel kind of bad when somebody says no, mm -hmm. you know, because what are they essentially saying? You're not good enough. Or, but I have, I have hired a lot. I, I've interviewed a lot of people and maybe didn't hire somebody for this one because there was somebody else that was a little better, but it didn't mean that that person wasn't good enough, and I ended up using them later, and the same thing happens to me. I mean, I still interview for jobs, and sometimes I get them and sometimes I don't. You just kind of got to chug along like, you know, the little engine that could and just push through it and let it, let it slide off your back and keep going, keep going. If you really want it, it's perseverance. Definitely. I mean, my name starts with no, so oh. I've had to get used to that whether I liked it or not. <laughs> All right, any last questions in the audience for our wonderful ladies right up here? I was wondering, you touched on imposter syndrome a couple times earlier, and just when you're getting started in the industry, you don't have that much experience or background, and even if you do get the job, you feel like you don't belong there. How do you get over that and just continue persevering? I never, I've never gotten over it. it. Part of the reason, but it's part of the thing that's exciting about the job too, is that, I, honestly, I'm really, and you know, I don't know, you guys should speak to this too, but it, there's every single movie or TV show, there's something new and you don't know how to do it and you have to figure it out. Every, mm -hmm. and, and often a lot of it is that way. And, but I like that, I'm attracted to that. So I want to, you know, it just, it doesn't really matter how you feel in a certain respect. I think, Those things yeah. that changes over time. You just put yourself out there and kind of, you know, uh, acknowledge the feeling. Don't deny mm -hmm. it. But yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Just being honest, being able to articulate this is what I'm feeling. There's a certain therapeutic angle to all of this. You know, don't be afraid to get a therapist. Um, but also, <laughs> um, but also, it, I'm serious. Like, it, I think a lot of us in the industry have to have that because it, because it is. Because there are so many people you meet, and you you have to figure out who you can trust, and and your self esteem is always on the line. Um, but I would say that um, doing your homework as much as you can is a big part of it. Um, it I'll, I'll speak as someone who is identifies as a woman and, and kind of came into the industry saddled with my, uh, how I represent myself as an Asian American, as a woman, um, and feeling obligated to fulfill the idealized versions of every category that I belong to, and, and also being a director, a filmmaker, a storyteller, a writer, an editor, um, and, and that's a lot of work, that, and a lot of pressure I put on myself. And I, there is something, something has to give, and it might have been my pressure on myself as a woman. <laughs> uh, instead, kind of re remembering that there are a lot of individuals out there who don't think about how, they're the, how to be the best daughter, how to be the best mother, how to be the best woman. They're just doing their thing, whatever that thing is, you know? Yeah, there you go. And I always tell myself that fear, it's, it's a fear, basically. That's what it is. Let's call it what it is. It's fear. 
and you're scared because you're scared of what mm -hmm. you're failing basically you're scared you're gonna fail but what I've learned to do is mm -hmm. I've learned to realize that fear is an indicator of something great that is on the other side of that door mm -hmm. and so what I do is I push through it mm -hmm. and I teach you know people to push through the fear I teach my children the same thing because on the on the other side of fear is greatness even mm -hmm. if you fail there's still going to be an opportunity for you to succeed. And so that's what I have to always tell myself. P Valley was a, a huge show, was the biggest show I've ever done in my entire life. And I was scared to death. But I made it, and I did it, and I accomplished it, and I succeeded. And that's what's on the other side of that fear. And so that's what it is. That's right. Yep. Yeah, I would just add stay, stay curious and stay open. I mean, that's the way you learn and that's how you move forward. Absolutely. Well, that was all amazing advice for everyone out here. Um, again, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you again. Um, looks like all the time we have today to our panelists, Jennifer, Arlene, Cameron, Hannah, Melanie, and Brigitte. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> thank you guys so much for sharing all of your insights with us and empowering the next generation of females. Also, a huge thank you to Impact 24 PR and for Comic-Con yeah. for putting this on. But do not go anywhere. The fun continues in this room with two more exciting panels, part of Impact 24 PR's Super Block panel series. So sit tight and don't go anywhere. Thank you, guys.